All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So thank you guys very much for joining. We're going to kick off a month focused on reporting season today. And uh, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about fundamentals of companies and some different things you can look for, but more on that in a second. First, anything you hear today is general advice. I obviously don't know anything about you, so I can't offer personal advice, but questions are great. And obviously, you can throw those into the chat, you can throw it into the q and I'll pause a couple of times as we're going through to answer some questions, and then I'll save some time at the end as well. All right, so why don't we get started? So as I said, it is reporting season. So of course, this is our twice yearly look at how companies are doing. And next week, we'll spend some time talking about things you can look out for in this specific earnings season. But as a basis for that, we'll talk a little bit about the fundamentals of a company because, of course, Every time we go through reporting season, we're getting all sorts of different opinions. We're obviously getting the actual company releases, which are generally massaged by somebody in marketing or PR to make everything sound great. We get to then see the markets and some reaction to how a company does or how at least the market interprets how they've done. And then, of course, we get to hear from lots of analysts like ours at Morningstar, about their interpretation of the results. It can all be very confusing. And I know from experience, you can be left at the end of these things, not really having an idea what is important, what's not important, what you should be looking for. So we're going to start with just the foundations of looking at a company's financials, because of course, when you're investing, you are purchasing a portion of a business. So we want to get our business hats on. And think about what we're actually trying to accomplish as an investor and what makes a good company and what makes a bad company. So I like this Bill Miller quote on the top. So Bill Miller is a portfolio manager from the U.S. who does have a pretty good track record um, until he ran into some very big issues going into the global financial crisis. But either way, he has a good quote. And it's important to have this perspective. So all of the information that we have, of course, about a company is the past. And when we do get a reporting season uh, update from a company, of course, this is talking about the past. It's talking about the recent past. But all of the value in a company, all the value in an investment, of course, what happens in the future. And we see this a lot during reporting season because obviously as soon as a company reports. Obviously, the share will start trading again the next day. Maybe doesn't move much. Maybe there's a dramatic fall. Maybe there's a dramatic rise. But we need to understand, of course, that as soon as that happens, as an investor, whether we own that share or we don't own the share, we, of course, have a new price of an investment we own, and we have to evaluate what's going to happen in the future. And the past can be a opportunity to perhaps project what we believe is going to happen in the future, but we need to keep some fundamentals in mind. So we're going to talk about what makes a great company. And we're going to sound a little bit simplistic here. Of course, we hear about all sorts of financial ratios when companies report earnings and all sorts of professionals coming out with interpretations of how they've done. But we do need to sit back and look at, okay, what exactly is a company and what makes a great company? So we're going to look at three different factors. And we'll spend a lot of time today looking at all sorts of different things. But remember, Fundamentally, there are three things we worry about. If this was a small business that we owned, these are the three things we'd worry about. How much they sell, right? So that's very important. We'll hear a lot about top line, top line growth, perhaps. Maybe they'll describe it as revenue growth, but how much a company sells is important. So very simply, and this is especially important given given what's going on right now in the world, is all we're really looking at is the number of units sold. Now, units could be anything. Of course, if the company is manufacturing something, it could be an actual widget that they've created. How many of those are sold? If you're a consulting company, it's how many hours you've sold. All sorts of different ways to measure this, but how much did you sell and what was the price you sold it for? Now, we'll spend some more time on this next week, 
But obviously, in an inflationary time where lots of companies are raising prices, we can see revenue growth. And we can see revenue growth because those costs per, or those uh, prices per unit are going up. We need to interpret whether that's good or bad. But either way, revenue is important how much they actually sell. What's also really important is, of course, is how much they keep. So when we think about a financial statement, so companies release three different types of financial statements, but when we're thinking about the income statement, we have the top line, how much did they sell? They sold a billion dollars worth of goods or services, for example. Then we wanna move all the way to the bottom line and talk about how much they keep. So that's why we talk about top line, bottom line, because, of course, we're looking at a financial statement. And everything in the middle is, of course, all the costs associated with that company. Now, some of those costs can be direct costs that are related to producing whatever they are going out there and selling. So in a factory, what does it cost to get those raw ingredients and create whatever you're creating? What does it cost from a salary perspective to create that widget? Then, of course, there's all these other expenses. There's, of course, general expenses associated with running a company. So what are all the different things a company has to pay for things like human resources that don't necessarily contribute directly to what is being produced, but also are really, really important to run a company. Expenses can be servicing debt, for example. All sorts of different things go into that, but we're really interested in what they keep. And that's that bottom line. And there are various different types of margins looking at different parts of the income statement. But really, overall, what we're looking at when we're looking at the margin of the company is what percentage of every dollar of sales that they make is the company keeping. And of course, when we say is the company keeping, it really is what flows to us as the owners of a company. Just like if you ran a small business, it's great that you've sold a bunch of stuff, but what really matters is what is that income at the end of the day? So we are very focused on that, uh, that as a company. And you'll often see in all of these earnings reports, no matter how or what terminology they use, is we will see some sort of top line sales grew this much. We'll see bottom line income grew this much, hopefully. And they'll talk about that margin. And margin is especially important, which we'll talk about during an inflationary time, because we want to see what types of companies are able to um, are able to maintain that margin, and what types of companies are actually eating a lot of those costs that we see going through the economy. So, margin is pretty important, and then also we want, of course, the companies that we own to grow. And how do you grow a company? Well, ultimately, you need to invest in it. Now, the money that you invest in a company can come as a portion of your profits. You can reinvest in the company. You could go out there and borrow more money to have the company grow. Or, of course, you could go out there and issue more shares for the company to grow. So you can do those capital raisings. You can fund things from internal capital. But really what we're interested in as investors, just like we'd be interested in if we ran a small business, is what is the return that they're getting? on what they invest in the business. Of course, we want a high return. And we'll talk about some of the implications of this in a second. And there's some different measures that we'll go through there. But really, fundamentally, this is a company. How much do they sell? How much do they keep? And then what return are they getting on investments into that company? And that makes a great business. If we can grow our sales, if we can expand our margin and get to keep more of those sales, and then we can continue to reinvest in the company and earn a high rate of return on those investments. So all very important. We'll talk about the implications next week about the current environment, things we want to look out for. But just remember, to, it's important to keep that in mind. And of course, no company operates in a vacuum as a small business owner or as the partial owner of a large publicly traded company, we need to understand that, of course, there is competition going on. As I always say on these things, capitalism really at the end of the day is competition. And when we think about capitalism and competition, it's supposed to benefit us ultimately as consumers. So how does it benefit us? Well, it benefits us because we get better stuff. 
because companies are continually trying to improve the goods or services that they create. They go out there and sell, right? Something better should sell more. So they're trying to continually improve that. And they're also continually trying to undercut competitors. So it means they're trying to continually lower prices. And that's very good for us as a consumer, right? We want better stuff and we want it for cheaper, but that's not really good for a business. So of course, competition is not good as a business owner. We would rather not compete because that means we can keep more of the profits. We can continue to grow the business. I hope it hasn't gone silent. So someone just said it's gone silent in the chat, which Hopefully everyone else can hear me. Okay, other people can, can hear me. That is good. Um, all right, so we don't really want that as a uh, we don't really want that as a company because those competition that competition leads to bad outcomes. And let's think about this a little bit. We'll talk about the implications of those uh, those bad uh, those bad outcomes. But really, at the end of the day. The whole point of uh, capitalism is supposed to be this free market where new entrants can come into the market, where companies can release different competing products. And that's how it actually benefits us, right? That competition. So if a company is growing sales really quickly, people will copy them. They'll try to introduce a better product. Don't buy their product, buy ours. Here's why it's so much better. Or they'll try to introduce a cheaper product. Uh, you don't need all those bells and whistles on that product. Just come buy ours. It's actually cheaper. Now, the problem is, of course, if a company doesn't do anything here, then, of course, it will erode market share and slow sales, right? So if you are the only company out there doing something and somebody comes in and copies you, well, that's not great. There's only a set amount of a pie that you can go out there and capture. Now you've got other people going in there and taking slices of it. So that can erode your market share and slow sales unless you do something. So what do we do, of course? Well, we make our products better. We tell people it's better through marketing, which of course costs money, and we might lower prices as well. So that's how we respond to competition. All these activities, of course, lower your margin. Right. So we're trying to maintain our sales here. We don't want somebody to erode our sales. And we do all this stuff, which ultimately means that we get to keep less of it. And of course, the less market share a company can capture and the less profit they earn on those sales means that those returns in the investment, the returns that we invest in the business, that capital we invest in the business, will get a lower return. So Hopefully this all makes sense conceptually, but this is really the effect of competition on a business. And we want to guard against that. Um, good question by Dallas. I'm getting to that in one second. We want to guard against that as a company. So where does that lead us to? Well, it leads us to moats. And spend a couple minutes talking about moats, not a couple seconds. But this idea of the fact that capitalism is this free market, freewheeling competition isn't necessarily actually true in practice. There are some companies that are able to fend off over the long term that competition. And they're able to do that without having to resort to all these bad things for us as investors. So they don't have to have their market share erode their sales slow. They don't have to have that happen. They don't have to have those margins compress as they continually invest in the business to try to create better products and services. These are companies that are able to maintain very high margins. They're able to maintain market share without resorting to continual investment, um, high levels of investment, and a bunch of marketing spending and all the things that we don't want our companies to do. We don't want them to spend money because we want to keep more of it. And what this means is that, of course, investments in those companies that the company is making, not your investment, but the investments that the company is making to try to grow that business, they'll earn a higher return. So that's really what a moat is. It is this sustainable competitive advantage that is keeping competitors at bay. And that is the definition of a great company, right? That they are not having to react 
to all these different competitors out there, that there's something, and we'll talk about what that is, there's something that's holding those competitors at bay. So let's talk a little bit about moats, and I'll explain this very quickly since I have done this before, but if there are any questions, obviously just let me know. So at Morningstar, and moat is not a Morningstar concept. Um, and it, of course, is a rating that our analysts give to shares that we uh, that we um, that we rate. But it is not a Morningstar concept. Really, the concept, the first person really to talk about moats um, and use that terminology was Warren Buffett, and he was once again, talking about the sustainable competitive advantage, what our analysts are trying to do is they're trying to put together a methodology that they use to evaluate companies in all different industries and identify those companies that have moats and will be able to sustain those moats into the future. And what they've done is they've classified moats into five different moat sources. And the five different mode sources are listed on these slides. I'll very quickly go through them. But a company can have multiple mode sources. Um, so just remember to keep that in mind. In different parts of a company, if it's a fairly diversified company, different parts of that company can have different modes. And some might have modes and some may not have modes. And what our analysts are trying to do is make an assessment of overall when we look at that business, even with all these diverse business lines, does that actual company have a moat? All right, so let's go through these quickly. So we'll start with intangible assets. And intangible assets is a little bit of a finance term here. When we look at, and we'll see these, of course, as they come out in the next uh, couple of weeks, when we look at financial statements that companies put out, they put out, talked about the income statement, they'll put out something called the balance sheet. So a balance sheet simply lists all the assets that a company has, and then all of the liabilities they have. So an asset, for example, I, don't, I always use this example because I think it's intuitive. A asset could be if you're a Qantas, what is an asset that you own? Well, an asset that you own, one of the assets you own is an airplane, right? That's a real thing. You go out there, you buy it, it sits on the balance sheet. So all the airplanes that Qantas owns sit on the balance sheet. They'll depreciate them over time. But those are actual assets. And those are assets that help the company make money. And you can go and look at those assets on the balance sheet. And then, of course, you can figure out pretty easily, how does that asset enable Qantas to make money? So in that case, the more planes they have, as long as there are, of course, enough customers, the more they can fly, the more revenue they make. So that's an example of a tangible asset. It is tangible because it is sitting on the balance sheet. And then, of course, we have an example. Then we have intangible assets. So intangible assets is something that you don't see. It is not sitting on the balance sheet. But it is something that you can, of course, um, use to make money. So I've used Coca-Cola as an example here just because I feel like it's a really – intuitive um, example. I know it's not an Australian company, but I'll, I'll get some Australian examples as well as we go through here. But when we're talking about Coca-Cola, it is a brand. And I'll, I'll give an Australian example. So a brand is an intangible asset. There's no entry on the balance sheet that says, what is Coca-Cola's brand worth? They've spent, you know, hundred plus years building up this brand so that, you know, wherever you walk in, Around the world, you can buy a Coke and you know what it's going to taste like. You probably think that it has a certain level of quality that is, uh, that is in there. So that's an example of a brand. Another thing is a patent. So there is no value for a patent, but that is an example where governments step in and they want to say, okay, well, we do want capitalism. We do want people to compete for customers. We also really want people to, we want companies to invest in their businesses. So if you come up with a unique idea, there is a length of time you can patent that for so that people can't copy you, right? So naturally a patent is something that holds competition at bay because they can't copy you. And that's a patent, a government license. So in certain cases, a government will issue a license 
to certain companies, and we can use an Australian example here, um, and say that, okay, well, we're, gonna, we're going to minimize the amount of companies that can go out there and get the license. And so one example, just because of where I'm sitting right now, I'm down in Barangaroo in Sydney, and right over there is the Crown Casino. So the Crown Casino, for example, is a government license. So New South Wales allows two different casinos in Sydney, so nobody else can go open a casino without a government license. So that is something that government license is not sitting on the balance sheet, but that has a value that they know that's protecting them against competition. And obviously, if the casinos would just stop laundering money. Maybe they'd be in good shape, but that is an actual benefit that can allow Crown, allow Star in Sydney. Um, it allows them to hold competition at bay because the government will not let somebody open up a competing casino, at least at this point. They can obviously change their mind, but that still has a value. And a couple other examples in here, pharmaceutical companies, right? So of course, if you invent a drug, you do get patent protection for a certain amount of time. It encourages those companies to invest in coming up with new treatments. Um, that's another example. All things that don't sit on the balance sheet. Now, that's an intangible asset. So you can see how that holds competition at bay. Cost advantage. So cost advantage is, uh, is a good one. Instead of using Amazon, we can, I know we're using a bank down here. All of the big four banks in Australia have a cost advantage, and they have a cost advantage from a couple of different things. But at a high level, a cost advantage means that if I can produce a good or service for cheaper than a competitor, that is a competitive advantage of mine, because it means I can do all sorts of things. If I want to make the same margin as a competitor, then I could lower my prices to below what they're selling for and still make the same amount of money at the end. Same amount of money comes out at the bottom end because I can produce something that's cheaper. So what is the cost advantage that the banks have? Well, one is just scale, right? So at the end of the day, there's always a benefit from scale from a business. If I started a bank with a couple other people, well, that's fine. I would have to go out there and Maybe open a branch. I'd have to hire a bunch of people, and that is, uh, and that is, of course, going to be something where it's going to be pretty easy for Westpac to spread those costs over a much larger base and be able to offer goods and services for cheaper than what uh, what I am, and they can undercut me on loans. And really, the cost advantage that the big four banks have in Australia is number one obviously just with their scale, but they also have a cost advantage from a funding perspective as well. They're able to go out there and fund the loans for cheaper. And they're able to do that because they have a very large deposit base. And a lot of that money is essentially free, right? All the money that's in transaction accounts doesn't really pay much interest to anyone. Well, that's a huge advantage for them. And so it's very hard for some of these mid-tier banks to compete with the big four because they have this cost advantage. And I use Amazon as well. Amazon's done this for years, um, particularly in the US where they have more scale, but they've been able to compete with all the other people that are selling undifferentiated goods and services at the end of the day. It started with books, obviously, it's expanded into almost everything, but they have the ability, whether it's their huge warehouses, whether it's just their distribution system that's more efficient, they or their ability to go out there bargain with the actual suppliers of those goods and services that they've always had a cost advantage and they're able to keep growing their market share. So that's another boat source. Switching costs. So we're gonna do banks again here. Um, just because uh, it's very intuitive with banks. A switching cost basically means that as a competitor or as a customer, you do not want to switch to a competitor. So no matter how hard they try, if it's a huge pain for you to switch, you're probably not going to do it. And I did see a question in there from Lisa around Apple. And Apple's building in a fair amount of switching costs as well. So at the end of the day, Apple has a bunch of different devices that you can have. They work very well together. And once somebody gets into that ecosystem and you have Apple Music and you have all your photos stored on the iCloud, 
it's a big pain to go switch and buy a Samsung, for example. And a lot of people just won't do it. They won't even consider doing it. So that's an example of switching costs as well. And the reason we always use banks is that once a bank has their hooks in you, all of a sudden there's all these connections, right? So you earn your salary, you've got a direct deposit going into your bank account. Can you switch that? Absolutely, but it's a pain and people don't want to do it. You've got all your friends in there, so you can send them money and you have all your bill pay set up. And then you potentially have multiple products. So you might have a transaction account, you might have a savings account, some term deposits, maybe a credit card, maybe you go out and get a mortgage from them. Everything's easy. It's on one page. It's easy to transfer your money around. And it takes a lot of work to go out there and switch all of these different hooks that the bank has in you into someone else. Is it possible? Yes. Do people do it? Generally not. So even if a competitor is out there offering a better deal, people are reluctant to make that switch. And we can see this with the banks in Australia, because all you hear about is people complaining about the big four banks, right? They're not passing along the higher interest rates to any of the savers or instantly passing it on to anyone who has a mortgage. You hear these complaints all the time, yet what do they do? They still control the vast majority of the market. There aren't big changes in market share. They kind of just tick on and tick on and tick on. And they know that there are things that they can do that maybe consumers don't like that isn't going to cause them to switch. Whereas there are giant, or there are no switching costs for other products, right? Think of things that you go out there and continually transact. If we go back to this Coke example, there are no switching costs if I go into Kohl's and decide to get a Pepsi instead of a Coke, right? They have, other than perhaps my preference, there's no reason I can't go do that. If I go in and Coke sold out, I can just buy a Pepsi. No switching costs there. But with banks, there's very high switching costs, which is an example of, uh, of, um, of another moat. Network effect. So network effect is a little bit of a tricky one. And I know everyone hates social media, but... I think intuitively it makes sense. So network effect basically means that the value of a good or service increases as more people use that good or service. And the way I always describe this with social media, right, is the whole point is to go out there and interact with your friends and make them jealous because you're in Europe and things like that. But that's not a lot of fun if you don't have any friends on there. So social media the less people that are on there, the less valuable that is for consumers. And as they get more and more and more people on there, that network effect actually grows. So that's an example of network effect. So really what we're talking about here is once you hit a certain level of customers, then of course it makes it very hard for people to switch. Who's gonna to switch to the new social media platform with nobody on it? And then finally, efficient scale. Um, and efficient scale is an interesting one. It basically applies to companies that serve very limited markets. And because the pie in that case, that total addressable market isn't that big, People don't want to bother to go in there and do it. So I use Union Pacific, which is actually a railroad. You think about pipelines in the same way. Once you've built a railroad, is somebody really going to go build another railroad right next to it? Probably not, because there's this high upfront cost to get in there, and that market is fairly limited at the end of the day, right? So if you're a Ryzen, and you are shipping coal down from Queensland, well, you've already locked in these contracts with all the coal mines up there. Is anyone going to build another railroad next to you? They could, but they're probably not going to. Another place that we see efficient scale is with pharmaceuticals, right? So if we have something that there's a giant addressable market for, so some disease that affects a lot of people, you're going to see a lot of competitors going out there, right? If there's a cancer treatment 
a lot of people get cancer, you're going to see a lot of people competing in that space. But if you have a very obscure disease that only affects a small amount of people, once somebody has an effective drug, there isn't really going to be another pharmaceutical company that's going to invest a ton into research and development to try to come up with a competing drug to treat that very limited patient population. Right. So that's an example of efficient scale. So those are the five moat sources. So as I said, a company can have multiple moat sources. And what you'll read in our analyst reports is you will read, number one, their assessment of the moat. So they would call it a wide moat. If they think that that competitive advantage will last for 20 or more years, they'll call it a narrow moat. If they think it will last for 10 uh, years and then no moat which is the vast majority of companies where we don't think there's anything sort of structural that is keeping competitors at bay. All right. Now, moats, of course, as I was describing them, were sound like, I don't know if they sound like an academic or this theoretical concept, but they actually play out when we look at companies. Now, remember, of course, when we're looking at how a company does, we're looking at the past. We want to make sure that moat is able to be maintained into the future. And there are things that can very quickly break moats. Um, you know, at the end of the day, and a good example of this, if, if people are old enough to remember this, is, of course, Kodak. And so Kodak dominated the film space. And that was all working very, very well until film basically went away and somebody invented a digital camera. And so that's just an example of how technology can very quickly erode moats. So we do want to be careful that when we're looking at these stats, of course, we're looking back in the future. But a moat, having a moat is an indication that you're a great company. Remember from that first slide where we talked about the things that make a company great, keeping those competitors at bay so you can sell more stuff, so you can keep more of it, so you earn higher returns and you're reinvesting it. And the real places that we see moats are two different places. We see it in margin. So how much do they get to keep of every dollar that they sell? So it means they're not constantly out there competing. They're not constantly going out there and marketing and trying to create better business and hiring new people and all the things that you're trying to do to compete. And we also see it on that return on invested capital. So that's really that measure looking at, okay, when we're investing back in the company, what return are we getting back? And what we want as investors is we want a return on invested capital that is higher than the cost of that capital, right? So that should make sense. And if I go out there and I borrow, to use a simplistic example, if I borrow from the bank at 5%, I don't want to reinvest in my business and earn 5% because I might grow my business then, but I'm not actually creating any value. What I want to do is borrow at 5% and reinvest back in the company at 10%. And this will be something that we'll touch on next week because it's interesting with this environment that as interest rates have gone up, of course, that raises a company's cost of capital. So it's very easy to go out there and exceed the return when money was basically free. Right. So when it was very easy to go out and get very cheap financing, well, that's great. Anyone could exceed that. It becomes a lot more challenging when interest rates go up and you're starting to pay more and more and more for things. So something important to look at. But what I did is I went back and I looked at, <coughs> excuse me, I looked at shares that have moat ratings. So wide, narrow, and none. And Looked at the return on invested capital. Where I got this from, by the way, is we do sell our moat ratings to ETF providers. And there's an ETF out there called Moat. And what that's doing is that's going out there and investing in companies where Morningstar analysts believe they have a wider narrow moat. And if we go back and we look at return on invested capital, so remember, this is how much they are making on those investments back into the company, how much profitability are they value are they creating for shareholders so you can see a pretty stark difference when we're dividing up the population between wide moat shares narrow moat shares and no moat shares so i think 
once again, if we put on our small business hat, would we rather earn a 13.5% return on what we're investing, that money we're putting into our small business, or a 4.8% return? Well, pretty obvious we want to earn 13.5%. And just think about interest rates, right? If you think about interest rates and them raising that cost of capital, all of a sudden, these companies with no moat are perhaps in a little bit of trouble, right? Because all of a sudden, if they're going out there and raising money through debt markets by issuing bonds, and they're paying more than 4.8% for capital, and that's the return they're getting, guess what? They're going to stop investing as much. All of a sudden, they're going to sit there and look at their list of 10 projects and say, all right, well, let's get rid of the bottom five because they're earning really low returns. we got to get that return on invested capital above what we're borrowing at. And so that's really why you see when interest rates are going up, it's one of the ways that, of course, the economy contracts. We slow down the economy. All of a sudden, companies are having to be more choosy about what they actually go out there and buy. And that's going to slow down the growth of those companies, right? So it's really going to impact that top line. So you can see if you're sitting there at 13.5%, you're like, all right, well, interest rates went up. It's not the worst thing in the world. You're down here, you're going to have to start thinking about your business and what you're doing and not doing. The other thing, of course, is operating margin. So when we talk about operating margin, we're really looking at, at the end of the day, we're sort of looking at the, basically what operating margin is, is it's looking at revenue and then comparing it to your operating profit. So how much of these day-to-day -day operations of the company are we getting to keep? Now, there's other expenses associated with companies. And the other expenses is net margin. That's when we're looking at top line versus bottom line. But either way, you can see, once again, there is a large difference between wide moat companies, narrow moat companies, and then none. So this really represents how much do we get to keep? We work hard to sell more goods and services. How much of that do we get to keep as a, uh, as a company? And how much do we get to keep as owners of the company? So we, of course, want companies with higher margins. Now, remember, as I said, all of these, of course, are looking historically and how companies have done. Really what our analysts are trying to do is make sure that those same business conditions that and same sort of structural advantages that the company had in the past are also going to be maintained into the future. All right, before we get into this, I think we have a couple of questions. Um, so yeah, we've got a transcript and presentation. If you want a present, if you want this presentation, just email me. So my email address is in the invitations, mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. I'll send that across from you. Um, so Jeffrey's asking, please explain what a moat is. Hopefully I did that. Where does the expression come from? Well, so originally it came from uh, Warren Buffett, who was the first one to come out of it. But really, conceptually, what we're thinking about here is, of course, a moat around a castle. So what does that moat do for a castle? Well, it protects it, right? So it protects it from invaders that are trying to get into that castle. And the same thing, a moat protects a company from competitors that are out there trying to compete with them. Um, so that's where that came from. Let me just see. Um, Uh, oh, so we have lots of questions. Uh, yeah, it's more about the slides. Um, yeah, we do, Lisa. So we do believe that Apple has um, has a wide moat. Um, so I kind of answered that already. Um, okay, how do you assess management as part of a moat? Did Anheuser Busch Bud Light? Uh, it's a tricky to figure, uh, but like Disney, et cetera, they're going down the woke path. Okay, so for people that do not know, um, both Anheuser Busch, particularly with their brand Bud Light in the U.S., and uh, and Disney have run into um, some issues that basically have resulted in consumer. Um, consumer boycotts in the case of Bud Light used to be the best selling beer in the U.S. It has fallen pretty rapidly. I won't go into the controversy and why, but um, yes, you can, I would say in, in both those cases, in Bud Light and Disney, brands are something that need to be protected. And at least over the short term, both those companies through some of the policies that, um, or some of the, I guess, the causes that they supported, there are people that disagreed with that. 
and decide to boycott the company. So brands are really, really important to continually maintain. It's because you build a brand does not mean it can't go away very, very quickly. So yes, management and maintaining that brand. And there's lots of different ways to maintain that brand. Obviously, quality is a big one as well. Um, there is, uh, There are ways that those can erode. Um, so, you know, it is difficult, of course, uh, it is difficult to predict as an analyst or as an investor what a company will do in the future and what will be the reaction to them doing that. Um, but yeah, it's something to think about with brand, right? That, uh, that, that, is not a, uh, that, that is not something that just lasts forever without work. You need to invest in brands and maintain um, and maintain them. Um, let's see what else do we have? Okay, so we've got a question. Uh, it's easy to see in big companies. Just wondering, is there any particular? Uh, what are if you can look for things in small cap companies? Okay, so a lot of the moat sources that we talk about on here are something that, as you said, are easy to see in big companies. So cost advantage, you know, what's, uh, what's one great way of having a cost advantage? It's scale, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, whether we are talking miners who are able to uh, go dig something out of the earth and ship it to China um, at a cheaper price than their competitors, whether we are talking about um, the banks, as we talked about, or any sort of kind of industrial company that builds scale, very easy to see with big companies. Network effect, of course, that's easy to see when you are meta and you have you know, I don't even know how many people are on Facebook or Instagram, but you have billions of people on these platforms. Very easy to see once a company has established up. What you're looking for, if you're looking for small cap companies, it is likely that small cap companies, most small cap companies, except in very specific situations, maybe around that efficient scale side of things, are not going to have a moat yet. And what you want to start looking for are signs that they can develop that moat. And um, that makes it a lot trickier, right? Anytime you're investing in small cap companies or small companies, you have to understand that there is more business risk associated with them. What that means is that because they are so hopefully growing rapidly, because they have very small market share generally, there's a lot of business risk. What if this doesn't make it? And so it's a lot more challenging. You're taking on more risk as an investor. Now, the reward can be a lot bigger, right? So if you went out there and buy these companies very early, that reward can be a lot bigger, but the risk is a lot larger. So what I would do is start thinking about the industry that they're operating in and who they're competing with and um, the dynamics in that individual industry and think about the moat sources that may apply to that industry or may not apply to that industry. And then start looking for signs that they're actually able to develop those moats, right? So if you were looking at, so let's say Tesla, for example, and I'm not saying Tesla is a small company, but really what a lot of people were worried about when Tesla first started is, well, building a car is hard and building a car is expensive. Expensive. And the only way that you can actually uh, lower that cost is through scale, generally, when you're building something large like a car. So you're starting to look for signs that, okay, is the demand there, first of all? Is there going to be demand for these vehicles? Can they do it, right? It's very complicated to build a car. Can they actually, from an engineering standpoint, do this and compete with these companies that have been around forever? So I think you have to think about that industry, think about the things that matter, and then start looking for those emerging signs that that company is potentially going to be able to build an established moat, right? So the best time to buy a company is not after everyone agrees that they have a moat, right? If you go through all those examples that I had, and partially this was intentional, was to make it pretty obvious so we can see what those moats are. But it's a lot 
more difficult to figure out a company is going to develop it to that moment. Just like it's a lot more difficult to figure out that some small startup company is going to turn into the next Google or the next Facebook or anything else. So it's a lot more challenging to invest in that space. Uh, but think about that industry, think about who they're competing with, and think about how could they establish that uh, that mode. And I'll give I'll give one brief example. I know sort of running out of time here. I'll give one brief example. Um, buy now, pay later, right? So what you'll often see in a lot of these industries is there's this huge first mover advantage, right? So that's this whole capitalism thing, right? I come up with a great idea. Well, for a while, that's going to be great because I'm going to be unique because I built this business and nobody else thought of this idea. Nobody else is competing against me. But eventually, if I do well, everyone starts competing. So we saw this with Afterpay. Right. So Afterpay came out with this model and they thought, OK, well, it's pretty simple. We'll go to a bunch of retailers. and We'll say, hey, we think that we've got uh, this opportunity for you to reach new customers. It's not really going to cost you that much extra. You just have to kick back a little bit of money um, on those sales. And if your sales grow, great. If they don't, well, no big deal. Um, so Afterpay started doing really well. We saw tremendous growth. So what happened? all these other competitors jumped in, right? So then we had Zip and I don't even know, there's like 50 of them, but we had all these other competitors jump in. And all of a sudden we started thinking, okay, well, what prevents me from switching from Afterpay to Zip? Well, nothing. In fact, I can have both apps on my phone and just kind of decide when I get in there, which one I'm going to use. But there's no way to differentiate those. So what did these companies do? Well, they started thinking, okay, we need scale. So they started raising a bunch of money from investors. They started trying to move to different countries. They tried to expand that scale, get into more retailers. They spent a ton of marketing, right? So they started cutting the amount that they were charging retailers. And they started cutting the interest that they were paying people or that people were paying if they couldn't make their payments. All of a sudden, this industry has turned into a bit of a disaster. And to make things even worse, all the established players at a certain point decide, well, we're going to get it there too, right? So Apple's in there. The banks are in there. Traditional credit card companies are in there. So that's an example of an industry that doesn't have a moat. And we can see the effect that even though investors were really, really excited about all that revenue growth and were jumping in there, as Zip kept coming out and saying, our you know, sales have doubled, our sales have tripled, blah, blah, blah. Well, investors really liked that until they started realizing none of the companies were making any money. Right. And as we just saw from uh, as we just saw from a comment, like Afterpay, at the end of the day, got bought out. The shareholders did very well because Square went out there and bought them, but hasn't done so great with Zip, for example, right? So Zip still isn't profitable. And our analysts, at least the last analyst report that I read about Zip, thinks they're going to run out of money before they become profitable. And they're either going to dilute everybody, all their shareholders, or, uh, or they're just going to run out of money. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a good example. Um, so another question, how are fundies like Kathy Wood, ARC, able to assess these new tech companies? Is there a process formula for them to analyze these companies? Yeah, um, I'm not going to pretend I know what Kathy Wood does. Uh, she seems to just promote her picks a lot, um, but it's really challenging. So I guess I would say there are, there are ways, and I think it's really understanding Number one business, I think in Kathy Wood's spot where she would say is that she understands emerging technology and how emerging technology is going to disrupt established businesses, which is really what she's looking to do. And sometimes that technology will do that. Sometimes it won't. Right. But I think really it's understanding how in completely new and emerging industries, who is going to be the winner? Right. We never heard of social media before. And we had MySpace, and Facebook and well, one, one <laughs> and one. I don't even know if they're still in business, but one didn't. And so in completely emerging um, industries, it's trying to pick the winner because there's a lot of value that goes to the winner. If it's a disruptive technology, meaning it's going into an established industry and trying to disrupt it, then it's saying, OK, well, what is this company going to be able to do it? Uh, and there's lots of industries that don't make a lot of sense 
and no offense if anyone's a real estate agent, but you still sit there sometimes and think like, how is it not more efficient to buy a house? How are we still paying all these giant fees to all these different people every time? It's so difficult to transact when we buy a house. Well, largely nobody's been able to disrupt that. And nobody's able really to disrupt that model. So there's been all sorts of technology startups that have tried, but nobody's been able to do it. Um, so yeah, I think that's an example of where, uh, of where there are uh, there are issues. Okay, I'm running out of time, but I'm quickly going to go through uh, a discounted cash flow model. So I'm going to do this very very quickly. I can send a longer presentation on this if anyone's interested. So basically, when we value companies, and I'm not asking anyone to create a discounted cash flow. Remember, when we value companies, what matters is what happens in the future, and the fundamentals about that business the moat, the competitive environment that they're operating in will obviously influence how much money that company makes in the future. But really what we're looking for is how much money that company is going to make in the future. And so as investors, we need to understand that what we're doing is we are projecting, remember the future is the only thing that matters. We are predicting what's going to happen in the future. And then we're discounting that back to the present day. Why do we do that? Why do we discount things back? Well, for the same reason that if I came up to you and said, I'll give you $500 today, or I'll give you $500 in two years, you're going to pick today, right? That $500 in two years is worth less to you. You want the money now. So what that means is cash flows occurring now are going to be worth more than cash flows that happen in the future. Just like if I said, I give you 500 bucks in five years or 500 bucks in 10 years, you pick five years. So that means we need to discount those cash flows that occur way out in the future. They're worth less to us. And so when analysts are going out valuing a company, what they're doing is they're looking at two different things. What do we think that company is gonna make in the future? And then what should we discount that back on? And so, I think we have a example of a, well, we'll go through this one first. So the art in this is trying to figure out how do we predict what a company makes? And that's why we're looking at all those three sort of fundamental drivers. Okay, how much is the company going to earn from a revenue standpoint? How much are they going to get to keep? Is that margin going to change? Is it going to reduce? Is it going to expand? How much do they get to keep? And then what are they going to earn when they invest in that company to grow it, right? Because sales don't generally just grow. You have to invest in the company and earn a return. It's all interrelated, but we're trying to estimate that out in the future. And this is an art, right? Like analysts may use models and everything else in Excel, but it is an art trying to figure out how this is going to happen. Just like it is an art and a more challenging art to try to figure out how some new small cap company is going to turn into the next Google. And so what you're trying to do is trying to figure out those industry dynamics and everything that is uh, and everything that's happening. There's a science involved. And the science is literally the math behind this discount rate. What do we discount back at? And most analysts will discount back at something called the weighted average cost of capital. How much does it cost for them to go out and get capital? And that's why as interest rates rise, cash flows in the future are worth less because you're discounting them by more, right? So if you discount something by more, it's worth less. Uh, so that's why interest rates impact valuations. That's why they impact valuations on everything. Um, just like if I was sitting there um, saying I would give you money in the future and I would give you money now, all of a sudden, if you know that you can earn 10% in the bank, if I gave it to you now, well, that money's worth even more to you now, right? Because you can earn money on it. So just remember, interest rates are going to uh, are going to impact that as well. Um, so I'm not going to go through the whole discounted cash flow model. Um, as I said, I can send a presentation to anyone that wants to uh, that wants to go through that exercise. But I will say this is how we need to think about companies. And even if we're not creating these models ourselves, and God knows I'm not, um, when I was uh, when I was younger, I would screw around and try to do this. But we just have to understand that these are the kind of fundamentals that are going to influence what companies are worth. And that as we go through reporting season and we start to use those results to try to predict what's going to happen in the future, then of course we can start figuring out 
what the market is doing and why it's moving based on how companies are performing. Um, and we're using that past information to try to predict what happens in the future. So, you know, what happens generally when somebody reports earnings is the market. So a lot of investors, a lot of analysts, a lot of portfolio managers will have in their head a view of how the company is going to perform. If the company has performed in a different way, they're going to go back there and reassess their model, right? So, and we did have a question come through. Oh, that's a natural, just example of DCF model. We have a question saying, how does cycles impact the DCF model? So when we're talking about cycles, we are talking about, of course, the economic cycle. So right now, central banks are trying to slow the economy, right? So as they keep raising interest rates, they're trying to slow the economy down. We could get to the stage where it's more of an expansionary um, expansionary uh, central bank policy. Where they're trying to lower interest rates. They're trying to get growth going. Basically what it is, it's just the economic cycle that we're going to go through. Things are going really well. Businesses are investing a lot. Consumers are confident. They're out there spending money. Wages are going up. Everyone's happy. Economy is growing. The economy starts slowing. This doesn't have to be huge jumps up and huge dives into recessions, but still, there is a business cycle. The business cycle is going to affect different companies differently. That's why we have cyclical companies, those are companies that follow the fortunes of the business cycle. And we have non-cyclical companies that generally sell essential goods and services. They sell medicine that I'm going to go to the doctor no matter what um, because I want to get this treatment and not die versus I'm going to go buy a Ferrari because I don't can't think of a scenario where I would buy a Ferrari, but because everything's going really well. So I'm going to go out there and spend money. So what are your needs and what are your wants? And companies sit at different levels around there. And not just with consumers, but also with business spending. And so really what we have to look at when we're creating a DCF model is we have to look at number one, how does the um, business cycle impact that company? Then we have to look at what is our prediction of where the economy is going? So you don't really have to worry about that too much if it's a cyclical company. Someone's going to buy beer no matter what. Um, but if we are selling luxury goods, then maybe people aren't going to buy them if the economy's not doing well. So what you have to do is if it's a very cyclical company, you have to overlay that economic viewpoint on top of that. And that's why, of course, when we get things like, will the RBA raise interest rates or not today? We're trying to get, as investors, we're trying to see into the future and how that's going to impact our view of different companies. And that's why those economic, um, those economic predictions matter a lot as well. All right. I just yammered on for a long time and I feel like we did get to the end of this. So sorry, I should have gone through a little bit more, but if anyone wants a presentation, send me an email. I'll shoot that presentation over to you. And then if anyone would like more information on sort of a DCF where I kind of walk through an example, I can send you a video on that also. So thank you guys for joining. I hope everyone has a good Tuesday. And we'll talk a little bit more about what to look at given what's currently happening in the economy next Tuesday. Um, and we'll talk about how we can evaluate results season. This video has been prepared for clients of Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or New Zealand Wholesale Clients of Morningstar Research Limited. Any general advice has been provided without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.